You're listening to the Grow Landscapers podcast. The podcast where we delve deeper into landscape business, interviewing legends of the UK landscaping industry. So, join host Nick Ruddle as he explores their thoughts, insights and experiences. That's here on the Grow Landscapers podcast. Hi and welcome to the Grow Landscapers podcast. I'm Nick Ruddle and today we're here with Paul Lynch from Elm Tree Garden Contractors. How are you doing, Paul? Hi, thanks, Nick. I'm all good. Marvellous, marvellous. I'm uh, very privileged to be a judge for the Pro Landscape Awards. And as you are the Supreme Winners and Winners of the Employer of the Year Award, I thought it made perfect sense to invite you onto the show. Because uh, obviously what you're doing is working well. So who better? The most um, recent winner of the Supreme Awards, uh, the Pro Landscape Awards. You know, I just wanted to pick your brains and, and hopefully people can learn from all your experiences. Um, obviously won a whole bunch of Bali Awards as well uh, to chuck in the mix. So uh, I know you're very... Uh, very successful you've been established for a very long time and run a great business so um anyway good to have you on the show uh thanks for asking me on yeah it's a pleasure it's an absolute pleasure so how long have you been in the business how, when did you start when did the business start if you just just give a bit of a background to to the business itself and um and then we'll take it from there so for elm tree it was started in 1969 by my dad and he was a fireman at the time in the fire brigade and he started Elm Tree just as a part-time thing. And um, then it sort of grew from there. So I think after he'd been doing it for um, maybe 12 years or so, he packed in the fire brigade and he took Elm Tree up full time. And he was doing quite a bit of work for one or two large clients in the area, uh, building houses, what was the forerunner to Taylor Wimpy. Um, and... I picked up a nice one or two local contracts and it grew from there, really. Um, so I started doing work in my school holidays right. from the age of 10. Um, <laughs> 10, slave yeah. Labor. Dead to slave uh, things drive. were a little bit di- uh, different back then. It was easier for young people to, to work on sites and get some experience. And I remember the first pair of work boots I got, my gran took me to the local Marks of Spencer and bought my work boots for me at the age of 10. Brilliant. So, um, <laughs> and I enjoyed wow. uh, working outside with the lads and mm. I looked up to some of the former we had in those days and I enjoyed doing a good job on site and preparing the ground and laying some turf. Mm. And I remember my first um, lawn that I turfed back then and I was really proud of it, you know? Um, mm. So, yeah, wow. yeah, that's how things started, really. And and as I sort of got slightly older, I think my dad hoped I was going to join the company. Um, and when I was 17, 18, I still wasn't quite sure. And because I'd been working outside in my school holidays, I was, um, I was doing a maintenance round, actually, for a brewery. And it was a brewery that had about 300, 400 pubs in the UK. And I was doing a round with um, another guy, Richard, who still works for Elm Tree now. And we had about 30 pubs, so we looked after. And we won an award that year because they audited and scored every um, pub and every round. So we went up to the brewery and presented with... Um, the award for, for the top average scores on the maintenance round. And I suppose it was my first taste of winning an award, you know? Mm, very so. good. We haven't stopped since, have you? No, true. true very good. True. So so what happened then? So after that point, so you, you didn't necessarily join the business straight away with your dad? Well, I did really, yeah. I mean, um, I went to Pershaw College. Yeah. I did a year's course in, um, it was an NCH in horticulture, landscaping, okay. and I went back um, before that, actually, when I was 16, I developed the uh, systems in a company for BS5750, wow. which was the uh, forerunner to ISO 9002, so when that was 16. pretty when interesting you, for when me. you were 16 years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's phenomenal. And an Elm Tree at the time, we're the fifth landscaping co- company in the UK, to have BS5750. Brilliant. Cool. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you went off and you got um, some qual- proper qualifications in the industry. 
And then what then came straight back back to the business and and, and you haven't looked back since. I suppose you've been there ever since. Yeah, really. I mean, initially I was working outside sometimes on the tools. I was doing a little bit of the management side. Uh, then it just grew from there, really. So I think I knew then after I was 20 or so, it was what I was going to do. Mm. And I really enjoyed it. And And as I sort of grew more into a management role, I started to put my own slant on things as well. And mm. I'm sure you know that the management styles have changed an awful lot in the last 25, 30 years. Yeah. Um, so it was nice to put my own slant on things, really, you know. So what, what was the what did the business look like when you started then in terms of the size, turnover, people, amount of vehicles, you know, that kind of stuff, the kind of projects you worked on? What did it look like then? So I think in those days, we probably had uh, 15 to 18 guys working for us. It was yeah. my dad's um, landscape manager as well. We had an admin person in the office who's my auntie. Um, <laughs> and, it, you know, mainly it was new new build site. So for the likes of Taylor Wimpy, uh, Level Homes, and several other smaller clients, um, it was all... Soft landscaping work, really. We didn't really touch the hard landscaping side of things. And we did ground maintenance as well. Um, the office was run from, from our house where I grew up. Right. And it was only when I was about 23 or so, we moved into a larger premises on a farm with plenty more space for us to grow. Mm. So what does it um, look now then? What does it look like now? So from eight, from 15 to 18 people, your auntie working in the office from home. And what does it look like today? So today we've got probably up to 60 people working for us. Okay. Um, we're to, um, I think my dad's last year, we turned over in the region of 875 grand. Now we're up to about six million a year. Wow. Um, where we've got um, quite a few large clients some, uh, for some really strong relationships with some good clients. We're building up our um, reputation. We've got an extremely good name. And I'm thankful for that because it's all about our guys to work for us, really, you know. Mm. And we're completing projects over 500K in value. Wow. I think our largest project was 925,000. Wow. So, um, yeah, that, then obviously win an Employer of the Year at the Pro Landscape Awards and win a Supreme Winner twice as well. It's a yeah. fantastic accolade. So we're really proud of that, yeah. Well, I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, this is this is what the whole point of, of this particular podcast is because I'm sure there's other podcasts out there how to actually become a better <coughs> landscape gardener. Mm. But this is about running a great landscape business. And, sure. and obviously by winning those, you know, you've got the stamp of approval there, hence why you're here today. Mm. Very good. So with all your experience and all the years of um, challenges and all the successes and the ups and downs that no doubt you had, um, what, what, do you, what would you say the most important elements are to running a successful business? I mean, you obviously have to make a profit. Um, yeah, because matter. if you make a profit, <laughs> then you can grow, reinvest your cash flow. But for me, it's all about people. Because if you get your people right and you get your systems in place, um, the profit flows really from there. So we need to... Uh, trust your team let your team uh, let your people learn from mistakes you can't uh, micromanage your people I've learned that before and if you give people enough trust and let them learn then you see it back um, and personally I would never ever um, tell somebody off in front of another person working under them it's not right it's not fair um so if you've got an issue with somebody talk to them one-on-one -on -one. um one of the things that i learned back probably 10 years ago 
we're showing appreciation and praise and that's so so important you know mm. um if people feel valued working for you then you see the return um in the investment in them yeah it's so good um yeah. people generally want to feel a uh, human trait is to want to feel valued and mm. and really um like, like they've, they've got a part to play and that they're appreciated and, and when you recognize that it really does help so um it's interesting you said earlier that when you were 16 you started up the system so you obviously see value in in creating systems and processes mm. and i think if you get the people right and you get the people working great systems and educate them on the systems and the processes then as you say the byproduct of that is profit, isn't it? Sure. Improved in efficiencies and profit. So you got you got to have the systems in place for people to be able to know what the processes are in order to know how to follow them. You know, do it the the, the elm tree way. So um, good, good, good. So people, systems, profit. Yeah, without the profit, there's no business, is there? <laughs> so um, yeah. So that's all the good stuff. So, but looking back then, looking at back, maybe some of the setbacks you've had, what, what, what would you say the biggest challenges you've had or the, the obstacles that you've overcome in, in the past? Um, if you just want to explain what they might be, um, what you did about it and potentially what the outcomes were. So, so I think the biggest one for us um, was the recession, 2007, 2008. Mm. That was really, really tough because in those days I was managing everything myself. So I was invoicing, I, I was managing the guys wow. and it was a really stressful time back then. Mm. And I'm not sure um, if we're going to touch on mental health or anything like that. But, but in those days I was drinking quite a bit just to try and cope as a coping mm. mechanism. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the recession hit and I was so concerned about keeping the skills in the company, the skill set, because I, I knew then it was all about people. Mm. So we took on some work at a fairly low margin just to keep the turnover there and ensure that as we came out of the recession, we had that skill set still. Brilliant. So um, it worked well because, because as we came out, in 2010-11, I started to look at how we manage our people and how, how to get the uh, best out of people. So I took up, so I looked at various things and I decided on investors and people. Mm. So I engaged the services of a consultant to learn all about managing people and how to get the uh, best night of them and develop systems for um, for appraisals, Brilliant. performance reviews and all of that sort of thing. And about a year after that, we went through our first visit from an investors and people assessor and we sailed through it, thankfully, mm. and started growing really from there because as, as, as we had this systems in place for people it was easier to grow yeah. you know um so that challenge and i always like to see a challenge as a positive what can you gain from it you know mm. so that was probably my biggest personal challenge of uh, that recession and then the other challenge which has been the same for everybody really was covid mm. and obviously it was how to manage the impact of it again keep the skills in the company the furlough scheme was really great if it wasn't wasn't for that we'd have been really stuck um like a lot of people so, yeah yeah of course of course so um look these times when, when you get crisis whether whether it's the credit crunch you know 2008 whatever it was um and for, for a good few years or whether it's covid big global pandemic you know when in times of crisis, uh, even though you can't see it at the time, they tend to be the most important and most valuable times because you, you learn a lot about yourself and you think, right, how can we do things differently? And you could even, you know, you've got two choices. I mean, you, can, you can sort of put your head in the sand and, and be in denial or you can think, right, what can we do about it? How do we come out of this stronger? How do we benefit from this? And clearly, you know, I like your honesty with, you know, you, you had a few 
a few drinks at the time because of the stress. But um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of other people listening to this now where, you know, they, everyone, we're, like, we're all human. And I think people uh, respond to, to things in different ways. And, um, and fair play for you to, for, you know, for coming out the other side of that. But, um, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of people who that will be in the same boat. So you've learned a lot. And as a result of that, you did the investors in people. And from, from what I know about that scheme, it's probably one of the best things that you, that you can do as a business, I know because of your employer of the year and the Pro Landscape Awards, I read reams and reams of your entry and, and, and I read a lot about what you've done in the investors and people scheme and how well, how, how impressed the, the assessors were, you know, when they, when they uh, read your, well, when they come and audit you. So yes. um, as a result of that, then how much better would you say your company is now um, on the people front? Sounds like your biggest focus is all about the people. Yeah, I don't think there's any comparison really from what it is now to what it was going back 20 years ago in terms of people. We've always been the sort of company that um, cared about people, but it's having uh, systems in place now and actually having a plan, performance reviews, as I say. We're talking about having a 360 management feed, uh, feedback review um uh, plan so we all um we all look at our ourselves and and what our skills and shortcomings are so we can improve on those so it's all continuous improvement so yeah there isn't um, any comparison really to to what we were back then yeah it gives you a really good framework doesn't it a real, gives you a plan a structured sort of um action plan if you like because i suppose you know what you want to achieve mm. in terms of i would really want to build a company and look after the people and i want you know to, to to look after everyone but you don't necessarily know how to do it so i suppose that gives you the roadmap that you think they, that they say right you need to have this in place you need to do this you need to have appraisals you need to have values you need to have a vision you need to have meetings you need to have structure you need to have systems i suppose all those kind of things but you don't know that until you know it so i think that gives you a nice um specific... you have to ask for help um and if you do so you think um, you can't learn everything yourself just by looking on Google and just by reading books. So you need to ask for help. And that might be help in the network you have locally. It might be help in the um, trade associations you're in. For example, Bali are fantastic. Yeah. And they, they have um, an officer for uh, technical stuff. You have your local meetings where you can attend and it might be a walk around a garden it might be a talk but there's other landscapers there and yeah. if you attend those and you talk to other people there's people in the same boat as you or who were in the same boat as you five or ten years yeah beforehand you know yeah. so use that network and ask people mm. and the la landscaping industry it's such a friendly industry, I find. Yeah. So there's always somebody that's uh, willing to take the time to explain something to you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, actually, wh where I have learned something, is entering the awards for Bali, where the uh, um, judges come out, uh, um, look at the jobs with you. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've learned things from the judges' visits as well. Technical things that I wouldn't have had a, yeah. a clue about beforehand. Yeah. I've learned that from the judge. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? I think a lot of people we've had on the show already have said, get out there, speak to people, because it can be very lonely running your own business. If you try and do yes. it all yourself, it's, you're in your own bubble. You're never yeah. going to pick up, you know, the, the knowledge that you need. But through Bali and the APL and, um, and Pro Landscaper Awards and all those things combined, getting out into the community, mm. like you say, there's people that have done what you are trying to do previously you know there, there's people that are you know that have been there done it and if you can lean on them and like you say the industry is really friendly and and very yes. abundant everyone wants to help each other mm. and i think you just got to reach out to people and ask don't be afraid to ask i think that's a common yeah. theme with everyone no, very good good great points exactly. there so um if i was to ask you put you on the spot and ask you if, if there were three tips or three bits of advice um that you could suggest that would improve a company's efficiencies or profits what would you say the top three things would be to in order to improve your profits and your efficiency to improve profits for me improving profits comes from from people 
Um, mm. And it's got to start with staff retention because um, it can cost up to £20,000 for you to recruit and train a new member of staff. Yeah. So if if you're going to waste £20,000 mm. on um, or spend £20,000 on recruiting and training somebody, it's a lot better for you to look after the people in the company at the time. Yeah. So I've got, got to say that uh, number one for me mm. is to look at ways of retaining your staff, whether that be um, training, um, communication, doing appraisals, looking at where they can move up in a company, make sure there's a clear line of progression so they can move up. We, we've always liked to recruit um, to, to promote from within. Yeah, wherever possible. Um, and it's so fantastic to see people that have started with us that have said they've got no ambition whatsoever of uh, moving up the ladder and suddenly they're supervisors and managers in the company, you know? Yeah. Um, so pe- people is my number one thing because everything stems from them. Yeah. Um, in terms of profit, the second tip, um, you need to be making sure that, that you're making a profit on every job. So you've got to have some system of measuring your profit. Um, and it depends what size you are, but, but you've got to be uh, costing your job properly, making yeah. sure you know the value of any goods you're buying Mm. and if it's a project in times like this where the cost of materials are changing so quickly ensure that you put in your uh, quotation that this price is only valid for 30 days or 60 days whatever because costs can change so much and then throughout the job just ensure you're keeping tabs on the expenditure so you know that you're going to run that job at a profit. And if you don't make quite as much profit on one job as what you wanted to, just look at that that spreadsheet and see where it didn't go quite as well so you can improve mm. on the next time. Yeah, knowing your numbers. So good. I think you couldn't have asked for better better answers there. I think they're spot on. Would there be a, a third and final one? <sighs> I think you've nailed them, to be honest, <laughs> with knowing yeah. your numbers, getting your pricing right, getting the right people you know, I think I think that in, in, incorporates quite a lot of those. Really, I, I don't I don't want to put you under any more pressure than I just did. So, uh, moving on to the next question, then. Oh, One thing on. I would say is to, that don't be scared of investing in your team hmm. because it's easy for somebody to think, "Oh, if I spend." £1,000 on a course for this person, mm. and then I spend X amount on doing appraisals and that, then if they leave in six months' time, it's all a waste. But mm. actually, if if that person feels that you're investing in them, they're a lot le- less likely to leave. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I've always said, if there is a business case for anything, I'll do it. Yeah. Whether that be buying a piece of machinery or paying for mental health training for somebody or for buying a new vehicle. If there is a business case, I'll do it. And um, if people know that you, that you uh, think they're, they're essential to you and that you value them, they're a lot more likely to stay with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're prepared yeah. to prepare to invest into them. So the mm. trouble is if you don't train them, they stay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and if, you're not, if they're not adding value, you know, then, then really, you know, what's worse, you know, invest in them and they go or, or not invest in them at all. Yeah. You know? So, um, and I think like you say, there's, there's, there's that law of reciprocity. You know, if, 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 if you give back, give them, they want, they want to give back. And, um, yeah. and when they become more valuable to you because they've got more knowledge, then you should really get better performance, shouldn't you? Off the, off the back of that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's probably four people I can think of now who would have left in the last two years if if we hadn't been the sort of company that invests in them. So we did um, four people who were suffering 
with either depression or or other um, or other issue uh, mental health issues, and where we have an open policy and we talk about mental health as a company, um, and we do mental health awareness training, those people felt able to to approach us and talk, yeah. and so we find solutions and help help them. And those four people are in the company now. Yeah. So again, you know, if you think that to recruit and train somebody can cost up to twenty thousand pounds, potentially those four people stay in mm. as saved us eighty thousand pounds. Yeah, that's amazing. You know? Yeah, that's a great great thing to be able to do. Um, wonderful. So, um, if um, if you had any advice about someone at the moment so through, with your experience um you've obviously been through the tough times and um you've been through certain challenges and you've overcome those challenges what advice would you give to someone who's maybe a bit stuck in their business at the moment they, they want to expand it but they don't really know what those first steps are to take what would you say to them i think i would go back to what i said earlier on about um, using your network um, and if you're a member of a trade body then mm. Um, speak to people there, go out and meet uh, meet some other landscapers. I also think they're using a consultant or a business coach is really helpful because, you know, if you've started and you're growing, you don't know everything. Mm. And if you can lean on the people around you and other consultants another landscape and so yeah i would just say speak to other people don't try and find everything out yourself from google yeah that's a great bit of advice um, i think in any walk of life really if you want to achieve something you've got to look at model yourself on someone or a company that has already done it and seek them out and ask questions because yeah. you know it's no, there's no rocket science is it really i think people have been there and done it why try and reinvent the wheel and try and you know overcome these things yourself because someone's done exactly what you've wanted want to do what to achieve and they've probably done it really really well so i think it's great advice especially within specifically with the landscape industry i think they are so abundant everyone's very open and, and that's what a lot of people have said on this show as well just just ask pick up the phone drop us an email you yeah, know if, yeah, if you're yeah. stuck then people people are kind i think i've coached people in a lot of different industries pretty much nearly all the industries that you can imagine but out of all of those, I think the people in the landscape industry are so passionate about what they do. They tend to be really kind, really nice, genuine people um, yeah. the majority of the time. So you've got to use that um, that great benefit um, of being you know, within this industry. Okay, so I have one the, final question to you. Thing I would, yeah? The other thing I would say is to always have an open mind to change. Hmm. And don't just think because you've done something for five or 10 or 15 years, it's always going to be that way. Mm. So if you're open to um, change, then it can um, kind of brief a company and you might have a guy that's only just started out for you as an apprentice, but they come on board mm. and because they're young, they've got a more uh, technical mind than you or t uh, an IT type mind. They might have some different way of doing things you've never even thought of so it's important to always have an open mind i think and be open to change well i think that's a really really good point especially you know with with your company's history you think back from 1969 if if you or, or your dad never changed and you're still stuck in your ways you have to move with the times don't you and you, yes. you say when you're 16 years old you came in and started doing the systems so your dad must have been open to to change as well so maybe that's where you get that from Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it was dad, Dad's idea to do the B, BS5750. Mm. So we talked about it with me and we looked at it and I did a lot of the work on it. But yeah, so um, he was always open to change back then. Yeah, I think some of the changes I've made in the last 15 years have been a little bit new to him, a little bit um, more alien. Yeah. But yeah, at the end of the day, he is open to change, yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a classic kind of father and son scenario in a business. And uh, I've coached a lot of companies that either father, son or father, daughter and, mm. or, or son and daughter, whatever it might be. And um, 
and some of the challenges is about letting go and being able to trust and hand over the reins, you know, to someone because it's your baby, isn't it? You've nurtured it since 1969. And then all of a sudden you want to take a bit of a step back and think, well, can I trust the handing over my baby to, to my baby? <laughs> and um, yeah, and that, mean, that's often the challenge that people find, you know, but obviously your dad trusted in you. No, you're right. I mean, um, one of our clients, um, who's a friend actually now who I've known for years, he's, said to me quite a few times, he said, Paul, there isn't many companies that are passed down from father to son mm. that do better, you mm. know, and improve a lot of the companies passed down the, the sons or daughters might um, ruin things and just think it's it's there perhaps as a cash cow, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah we've, we've really expanded on uh, things that dad's, started out so yeah yes good so yeah good. so he could obviously trust you but look we said earlier he, he you well his his last year he did 875 grand net turnover and, and mm. now you're at six million i think the yep. numbers never lie do they mm. they always True. tell the truth so uh, there's definite um proof that that whatever you've done has been even better than what your dad did so your dad's set great foundations and you've taken it on to the next level um so okay if there was one golden nugget then i think i probably know maybe what it could be um but if there was one gold, golden nugget that you could give someone trying to build their business um from all your years of experience and knowledge and challenges and overcoming those what would it be it's about um people really isn't it next phil yeah. so you don't not to be scared of investing in your team because it's going to empower people. Um, if they feel that you're investing in them, they'll feel a lot more valued. When I started doing investors in people going back in 2011, we had something up on the board about what, um, what matters to people in a job. Mm. And there was money, there was praise, there was a feeling valued and, Money came up as about number three, number four, yeah. so it wasn't the most important thing. Yeah. I appreciate now because the cost of living crisis and everything, mm. money is a, um, a lot um, really important to people, but there's other things that are really important as well. So don't be scared of investing in your team. If you want to keep your staff retention up um, or improve your staff retention, your people have have to feel valued and empowered. Yeah, I think that's um, so, so good to finish up on. And look, that, that was one golden nugget, but the last half an hour or so has been filled with loads of golden nuggets. I'm sure there's a lot of people that will get a lot of really good information and, and good food for thought to, to get them thinking about what they could do differently to improve their results. So really, really appreciate your help. Uh, your involvement, your participation, your honesty, and and your experience. I think it's brilliant. So if um, if people want to get in touch with you then, Paul, uh, if they wanted to either pick your brains or if they wanted to um, engage with you as a contractor, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, through, our, through our website, which is www.elmtreegarden.co.uk or my email address, which is paul at elmtreegarden.co.uk. That's brilliant. I think you've um, you've really helped a lot of people out there. There's loads of wisdom there and nice bite-sized chunks. And um, I think you hit the nail on the head with everything you said. So, um, Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Um, thanks for everything. And um, we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks very much, Nick. I've enjoyed it. Brilliant. So have I. I'll catch you soon. Cheers, Paul. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Grow Landscapers podcast. To get in touch and see how we can help you with your business by emailing nick at nickruddle.com.